నమస్తే వెల్కమ్ టు ప్రాణా స్టోరీస్ థ్యాంక్ యూ ఫర్ ది ఓవర్ వెల్మింగ్ రెస్పాన్స్ ఆన్ మై ప్రీవియస్ పాడ్కాస్ట్ విచ్ ఇస్ విచ్ వాస్ అ త్రీ పార్ట్ సిరీస్ ఆన్ శ్రీ విద్యా తంత్ర సాధన బై గురు సకలమ్మ వి కంటిన్యూ టు డూ ది సిరీస్ ఆన్ ద శ్రీ ఆన్ శ్రీ విద్యా తంత్ర సాధన బై శ్రీమతి వినీత రాశింకర్ హూ ఇస్ అన్ ఆథర్ ఆఫ్ ఫైవ్ books on shri vidya tantra chakras dashama vidyas etc you should check her profile link given in the description below and also head to her blog post to know more about vinita rashinkar tune into this podcast where vinita rashinkar talks about fundamentals of tantra shri vidya and her own spiritual journey and also some guidelines of how anybody can adopt these guidelines to make their lives better it's been close to a year that we started prana stories and i can proudly say that i am 25 podcasts wiser owing all my gratitudes to the scholars the experts the authors the performing artists who have come and spoken their heart out with their particular stories and their journeys enlightening all of us with their knowledge and wisdom please like share comment and subscribe to prana stories if you haven't if you are new here please continue to support prana stories so that we can all enjoy and learn so many things that are around us loaded with wisdom and so many people so many scholars who are unknown who bring in a lot to know our own roots and our own civilization which is the oldest living civilization in the world today thank you namaste namaste vinita ji namaste praveen Thank you so much for having me on this show. It's my Before I could say welcome, you said thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Uh, so I, I'll let me take this opportunity. Welcome to Prana Stories. Thank you. And uh, like I keep saying to all my guests, my guest list is getting better and better going by each day. And this place, this studio is getting more, uh, what do you call, divine stuff. right in the presence of all these experts scholars and people who keep coming here so thank you so much for doing this and uh, welcome once again may your studio and yourself be blessed with an abundance of all things enriching thank you so much so i know you as uh, uh, an author of five books and those five books are uh, written in the topic of shri vidya yeah. shri vidya tantra to be specific right right so uh our conversations will be around this mm, but i would like to start in a uh in a different way like i keep seeing a lot of things on the internet right uh especially uh from the foreign handles uh, mm-hmm. you know from the us from everywhere uh, that is there um on instagram basically on instagram facebook and all is there is a lot of and even in india also especially in the areas of goa in uh, areas of rishikesh and all these things there are lots of these retreats that happen mm. from india obviously they uh, they try to attract the foreign audience mm-hmm. to come here uh, basically what they say is learn tantra mm. right or learn tantric sex mm. or learn tantric intimacy mm. uh, or it should be awaken your kundalini mm. in 10 days right or maybe there are even i have seen even um, videos that says or uh, heard videos that says awaken your kundalini in 30 seconds <laughs> right right so all this is a uh, tantra sort of simplified mm. they say that tantra simplified to the modern audience mm. that's what they say now i am so intrigued that is tantra that easy mm. right and people are making a lot of there is a lot of money that is going on in these retreats it is purely commercial right uh, and there are so many training uh, institutes mm. uh, that 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 come from the us that says that we will teach you tantra when you ask when you probe them they will say okay you know we are neo tantra mm. right yes so so many uh, terminologies that are just floating around and uh, tantric being a very cool word right yes. now on the internet right right uh, so tantric meditation anything for anything you just add tantric and it becomes cool right right i also see a lot of and that too mm. um, it it's very uh, the content that they put is very titillating yes right Uh, like skimpily clad women mm. they 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 try to show themselves off and then mm. you know trying to sell something like that right. so i don't know objectification is right there mm. uh, so 
so i just want to ask like is is this really tantra if that is not tantra then what is tantra and what is the uh, because i i have been speaking to a lot of experts mm. uh because they say vedas are the source of mm. uh the sanatana dharma right? right or any indic civilization the vedas are the source of truth right so where does tantra fit in mm-hmm. so yeah i asked you so many questions okay <laughs> so to begin with it is not tantra what the west is selling in the name of tantra mm. and the closest analogy i can draw is what they have done with yoga mm. so when we talk of yoga in the vedic system or as a sanatani we talk of the ashtanga Mm. right the eight limbs of yoga mm. and what has the west done with it they've taken only the asanas mm. and they make it out to be all about yoga the body the and body. the postures right. and you know the fluid movement like they also have something called ashtanga yoga mm. which is anything but ashtanga yoga it's just physical exercise it's mm. calisthenics at yeah. best yeah so in the same way they've done the same thing with tantra as well mm. tantra effectively means a methodology mm. in the simplest form of the word Mm. it's a methodology mm. now when we talk of tantra from a perspective of the vedas or from the perspective of the indic civilization we are actually talking about a method which uses yantra and mantra together okay in a certain ritualistic form okay that is what makes up tantra okay uh, you said tantra meaning the 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 components of tantra mm. for the audience yes. is also a yantra and a mantra correct that Those makes it tantra together yeah uh, comprise uh, to uh, come together as the tantra that you choose for yourself okay so you have your ishta devata mm. okay typically in the shri vidya tradition we are talking about lalita tripura sundari mm. and she has her own yantra which is the shri chakra yantra mm. and she has her own set of mantras okay. which range all the way from the bala mantra mm. which is just the most simple bija mantra mm. to the very elaborate lalita sahasranama for example okay. and all of them in between okay and so you have the trishati and you have the khadgamala and all of those okay so, so i'll sorry to interrupt i'll we we'll have to go break down sure. it for the audience You're right uh, you mentioned let's start with yantra and mantra mm. now what is a yantra a yantra at its most basic is just a geometry okay it's a sacred geometry okay so in the hindu tradition we have what are called mandalas mm. the mandalas then give rise to what are called yantras okay. now yantras are also like how they say that the vedas are apurushaya mm. which means it was not you know human mm. in the same way the yantra the geometry of a yantra does not come from human knowledge okay it comes to us from the universe itself okay so it's a depiction of the macrocosm okay so when we say macrocosm it also means the microcosm because there's really no difference between what's happening in the universe and what's happening inside an atom okay it's exactly the same thing okay so what the yantra depicts is this macrocosm and microcosm in a geometric pattern pattern and this geometry is actually sacred geometry okay which we have seen across civilizations across the world hmm so so as an example so in india we have the yantra as the Uh, s- someone might ask hmm. what is the equivalent let's say in a south american tradition do we have such examples so s- sacred geometry is spread all, all across over. the world okay. so any symbolism for that matter is sacred geometry even hmm. the cross hmm. or in uh, islam you have all the calligraphy even hmm. that is geometry hmm. or uh, the way that uh, you know they they perform their worship circumambulating hmm. and all of that hmm. so there are you can find parallels in every civilization okay so uh, okay now we s- we spoke about yantra that's the definition now let's move on to the mantra hmm. what is a mantra it's a vibration essentially it's hmm. not even the fact that it has to be pronounced it does not have to be articulated okay. but it every uh, alphabet every syllable brings its own vibration okay so uh, our rishis with their uh, intuition with the kind of knowledge that they had because of the sadhana that the practice that they did they were able to come up with uh, these syllables 
which are so potent and so powerful that they are able to actually connect us with the divine consciousness. Okay. So all these uh, syllables which connect us together with something larger than ourselves, I would say is the easiest way to define a mantra. Okay. Easiest would be the easiest mantra that everybody so popular is Om. Yes. Right? Yeah. So what is called the Pranava mantra, which mm. is also the uh, most uh, primordial sound as it were. Mm. Mm. So it starts from there and then you, we, we move on to longer, larger uh, articulations of uh, syllables, which are then strung together. Mm. to become suptams or shatakams or uh, sahasranama. Mm. Mm. So all these then become uh, larger uh, versions of the same bija, okay. but more expanded, mm. sometimes more potent, sometimes less. Mm. All the same, each one has its own value. Okay. So then, um, so tantra consists, consists of a yantra and a mantra. Yes. Now, you also mentioned Vedas, right? Right. So, if the Vedas were already there mm. as the source of, uh, as a guidance, as a source yes. of truth, mm. then where did Tantra come into the picture? So, yeah. let's start with Shruti. Mm. Okay. Shruti is that which came to us mm. from the Rishis, which mm. was only heard. Heard. Okay. And then we had Smriti, Shrutis, yeah. which was uh, what we, the uh, Rishis, mm. they gave their commentary. And on, documented it. Yes. Yeah. And documentation. Then you have the Itihasa, which are historical stories. Then you had the Puranas. Puranas yeah. And then finally you had the Agamas. Mm. So literally it was the uh, almost the culmination. Okay. And uh, so when all these were still uh, in the philosophic realm, mm. where it was still more about the thought process, it was not really in action. Mm. You can say Tantra is all of the Vedas in action. Okay. So it gives you a, a roadmap as to how to approach this philosophy hmm. in a f in a way in which is suitable for a person because if you look at all the vedic practices they are largely collective hmm. so if a yagya happened it was with a large number of people yeah. so you had one yajamana sitting there with a thousand witnesses hmm. whereas with tantra what happens is it becomes about you it's an individualization ah. yeah is it the difference between is that the difference when when say vedic practices are hmm you will have to be an expert mm. in learning all the Veda mantras and right. then you have to really be knowledgeable to do all that. And you had to be a Brahmin. Okay. Uh, where the Tantra came in was mm. that there were uh, women were excluded mm. from practicing the Vedas to the a Vedas. large extent. Yeah. Okay. But right. I, I've heard that there were women also who wrote uh, or who had the the mantra drishti of the, 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 the mantra drishtaras may have been women, mm. but what happened was uh, in the 6th, 7th, 8th century, mm. uh, the Vedas were largely practiced only by Brahmins mm. uh, who were very, very well versed in their subject of carrying out the yagyas. Mm. And the common man on the street mm. was excluded from this practice. So mm. it was largely the king who was doing the yagya. Mm. So uh, the common man was getting uh, very attracted towards Buddhism. Ah. So that is when uh, the Sanatanis at that time realized that we have to give something to the man who is not involved in the yajna directly, the woman who is not involved directly. So we have to find a way for them to not move towards Buddhism mm. and to stay within the fold of Hinduism. Okay. And that's how Tantra came into being. So like common man in the sense, any householder. Yes. Can do this. Yes. Okay. That's the other difference between uh, Veda and Tantra. Mm. That uh, Veda always talks about moksha mm. and how it is important to renounce the world mm. in order to uh, be on the spiritual path. Yeah. With Tantra, what happens is the householder can go about, enjoy all the pleasures of living and still work towards moksha. Okay. So that is also something which made life easier for a lot of people who felt that these two things can go parallelly. Okay. And that's when Tantra started becoming extremely popular, popular. in the 8th century. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, and that was around the time when even Adi Shankaracharya was, hmm. uh, you know, active. And uh, there was a lot of, at that time, focus on also trying to keep people within the fold of Hinduism. Hmm. Okay, okay. What I have understood is, uh, 
between the vedic practices and the tantric practices mm-hmm. is like vedic practices needed a specific set of skills right. specific set of knowledge mm-hmm. and specific kind of people yes whether whether they are a bro- born brahmin or they can by their by their practice they can become a brahmin uh, uh, that's what i assume it was there before right possibly right uh, i think it was more orthodox than that at okay. uh, in in that time uh, okay. when we are talking of 6th or 7th century mm. from what i have read it was a very orthodox kind of society that one lived in mm. where the brahmins uh, they controlled the entire religious system at that time mm-hmm. and there was not much scope for the regular householder who came from the other varnas mm. to really be a part of the entire spiritual process mm-hmm. i i've heard that there may be some exceptions which which people have like for example i mean i'm not not in the 6th or 7th century mm. but even before that right mm. um, like uh, sage vishwamitra was not a brahmin he right. was a kshatriya and became a brahmin right. so there are examples surely by practice yes. people have become brahmins as well right right um, um so yeah so wh- what i meant to say was vedic practices needed some set of skills and some s- kind of people and it was reserved for and it also meant that you have to sort of uh, uh, you know sacrifice your worldly kind of activities or worldly pleasures renunciation, renunciation was mandat- right? mandatory yes uh, it's not much for householders yes. there but then tantra tantra was introduced so that every householder can you know uh, do it uh, right uh, and even women are more it, it was more inclusive i yes. would say right more heterodox right. and more inclusive right uh, that was what uh, differentiated uh, it from the vedic practice yeah. but i think we should also appreciate the thought that okay uh, instead of instead of we keeping it ourselves i think we should popularize it and democratize it right. that thought is very appreciated yes. right um yeah that's nice uh, so then when you were speaking about uh, yantra mantra and then you also spoke a lot about um many other aspects you spoke about mm-hmm. i uh, cannot recollect right now mm-hmm. but shri vidya shri vidya as a tantra itself right mm. uh, the the practices that you mentioned mm. can you just can we just detail out what all does it involve so in shri vidya you choose what works for you mm. i think that is the um, um, the simplest way of putting it mm. because uh, you figure out what your personal tantra is ah, okay so the ishta devata is fixed mm. because it's lalita tripura sundari mm. and even with lalita tripura sundari there's something that we have to understand mm. that lalita means play mm. okay it's leela okay so that takes us to this whole wide world of simulation hypothesis mm. which in the eastern traditions we have called maya okay what is simulation hypothesis which nick bostrom put out in uh, 2000 mm. he said it's all about uh, this entire universe just being like a video game yeah. right that's exactly what maya said mm. if you look at what the atharva veda says it says that this entire universe is just uh, something happening in time and space it's just mm. a play happening in time and space mm. same thing is repeated in the rigveda as well mm. where it says this universe that you see was there before and it's going to be there after so this is just one session that's going on mm. one video game session which is happening mm. and uh, how i like to understand it is that uh, we are at a certain level in the video game mm. and uh, when this game finishes we have a certain set of tasks which is our karma hmm. so we take this karma and then move on move to on the next then. level it's like yeah. how much credits or how much exactly. points that you collect and it's then it's just that and then you move on to the next level hmm. of the game hmm. so we start with that so there's maya in uh, in um, lalita tripura sundari hmm. now we come to the second word which is tripura hmm. hinduism is replete with triads okay so the triads can be bhur bhua swaha mm. it could be the three states of uh, waking sleeping dreaming mm. it could be vata pitta kapha which is your mm. ar doshas it could be our three gunas mm. which is sattva rajas tamas, tamas. Mm. so you can keep 
on going you know with this list of triads mm. or it could be brahma vishnu, vishnu maheshwara mm. so lalita is the goddess of all the triads in the universe ah. including past present and future nice mm. then you come to sundari mm. which is uh, in a manner of speaking beautiful but also a ruler of mm. all of these things mm. so then when you bring all of this together you come to what is called abundance okay because shri vidya shri in the, uh, the word shri is abundance mm. it means uh, a lot of uh, good things mm. enriching things mm. now again in the west what has happened manifestation the moment you say the word manifestation, manifestation yeah. it's all about uh, fulfilling your material desires right you always hear people say oh so i'm i want to manifest this car and i want a house yeah. in a particular locality yeah, yeah. and i want so much money in my bank account and what they've done is they've narrowed the scope of uh, manifestation to a point where it's only become about uh, yeah. your material desires yeah. it's not that at all it's just Ac- a small part actually manifestation means everything which is enriching nice so what is enriching i mean it could be like if you have a career which is giving you a lot of joy that's enrichment mm. enjoying a compatibility a beautiful relationship that you cherish that is enriching or enjoying a conversation yeah or even your health for that matter yeah. i would like to you know in my thought i feel there are four quadrants to mm. living yeah so the the first one is of course <coughs> your uh, you know your economic growth mm. your economic um you know whatever you need to do to keep your life going well the material growth yeah uh, with work mm. work and uh, economics mm. then the second uh, aspect is your relationships it okay. could be companionship friendship even you know parenthood whatever it is all kinds of relationships yes mm. uh, the third quadrant is health okay which i think is the basis of everything because the moment your health goes out of whack then all the four quadrants just fall in a like a, a complete you know uh, they come into disarray and the fourth one is self actualization mm. which is that you do something every day to improve yourself mm. so it could be anything for me it's my shri vidya practice for mm. you it could be jiu jitsu or it could be mm. yoga or it could be anything but at least we are doing something every day mm. see now when we come into this world none of us are given all of these four quadrants in equal measure yeah okay something is going to be less something is going to be more but i think the practice of shri vidya is to ensure that whatever is in the quadrants you accept it with an equanimity mm. and you surrender to her mm. and say now this is where i'm at it's up to you to do wh- whatever you want to do with this i'm mm. i'm just a vessel mm. i'm just a channel through which you can do whatever you feel is right for me mm. and uh, the, the 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 belief and the hope is that she will balance it out all the quadrants she absolutely will because mm. she is the mother mm. so there is this beautiful story which i'm so fond of sure uh, there's a king because it comes from our own mythology and uh, he's an ambitious king like all kings are and he uh, approaches his uh, the main guru the rajguru and he says i want to double my kingdom so mm. the guru says okay so then you go and carve out your mother's heart and bring it to me and i will make sure that uh, your kingdom is doubled mm. so the king doesn't even think twice he goes he kills his mother gets her heart and he's racing back he's coming through the forest and it's night and he's about to fall and the mother's heart lurches when he's about to fall and she says son slow down you still have time <laughs> you will get what you want but don't fall and hurt yourself that for you is a mother's Mother, love yeah. and it's exactly what uh, mata will do for every single one of us mm. if we repose our faith in her mm. because her love is unconditional just like every mother's love mm. Mm. but there's also another aspect to a mother's love mother's love can be extremely fierce mm. when it comes to protecting her children mm. and for mata i guess her devotees are her children mm. so if you have faith in her she will draw you out of any situation hmm. Hmm. so then uh, when people say when i mean it's like a conditioning that happens in our homes that uh, god will punish you hmm. god will take your eyes hmm. 
all these things that people say mm. to you know keep a fear or or have that sense of fear mm. is uh, wrong right e- extremely wrong <laughs> because uh, the divine presence is non judgmental can never be malevolent in intention mm. then people ask then why is there so much suffering yeah the suffering is because of our sense of attachment with everything in this world because we are not practicing vairagya because the moment you start to understand that this is all just maya mm. and the moment you come to terms with that that, that there's no difference between you and me or difference between any uh, thing existing in this universe then the suffering automatically lessens mm. because then you're just a part of the, the, the divine consciousness itself mm. so then if that is the case if if the lalita tripura sundari she is the mother divine of everything mm. now the case i mean this is my personal thing mm. that uh, like you said there is lot of suffering i also see that then the terrorist is also uh, the uh, the child of the mother absolutely. right absolutely right now if the terrorist is attacking mm. you know as a as a as a community or as a region or mm. as a nation mm. i do have the my right to protect yes to protect my own community so now in that sense even i will become violent mm. right so these these questions keep happening in my mind that is it right he is also he's also a part of the mother should i you know all those things keep coming into my mind it it is a dilemma like if if you start thinking that way then you can't be really peaceful and say okay ahimsa i will when somebody is attacking you your self defense will come into the right. picture what do you have to say about it <laughs> all of it is absolutely correct because we are creatures of runanu bandhana hmm. so everything that happens to us whether we are victims of a violent attack or a non violent verbal attack which mm. can be equally harmful mm. it's all purely runanubandhana mm. it goes back from past lives from the karmas of our past life which need to be erased mm. when you look at it from that perspective the duality kind of recedes into the background a little bit okay. and gives you perspective that okay maybe i owed this debt to someone mm. so that is the reason why this is happening me to me today mm. nothing is random in this universe okay everything happens because there is a cause and an effect so the cause has happened before we are not aware of okay. it we don't remember it mm. but we are facing the effect okay at the same time then that doesn't mean that okay everything karma will take care can i sit quiet you cannot <laughs> because there is also something called prayatna mm. which is the effort that we put in mm. so uh, in karma in uh, karma also so in any action you have two kinds of fruit mm. you have the drishta phala so today when we are sitting here and talking the drishta phala is the satisfaction that we are getting out of conversing with each other mm. the adrishta phala which comes at a later time mm. it is not for you and me to decide mm. when it will come Mm. it will come it's a law of nature okay so that adrishta phala is not something we are seeing mm. right so now the adrishta phala has to match with the prayatna mm. when these two converge is when something magical happens now that is a miracle mm. so what is prayatna it's the effort you put in mm. now when people ask how does chanting help or how does uh, shri vidya sadhana help, help. see you're doing something out of your own volition okay it's something that you're putting an effort into you're sparing time for it you are doing it 100% consciously that's a karma right so that's an action which will bring result now what is the result it's going to bring it's going to bring you the anugraha mm. of the universal consciousness whoever is your ishta devata mm. that's all it's not going to bring the magic to your table mm. it's just going to bring a little bit of anugraha mm. which will bring you the miracle mm. it will bring you that serendipity you will meet the right person the right person will somehow get to know of you mm. and then things proceed like that mm. so yeah so uh, connecting all the dots that we spoke mm. as humans mm. uh, or at least in 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 sanatan dharma as mm. if you come as a manushya or as a human right 
the belief is that this is not just one life yes there are multiple lives and it's millions, a, millions of lives it's a cyclical thing yes and just like we said that it is a simulation like a simulation game yes you collect points mm-hmm. and you have those points right right and yeah. then you expend those points or you collect points or whatever yes. right and in this lifetime it's your prarabdha karma which you bring along which you, with you which yeah, you have to which spend which is a carry forward yes. from the previous right. previous uh, uh, janma or mm-hmm. previous life right and then you carry forward with it and there are also guidances available in the form of vedas mm. in the form of practices like tantra right. especially shri vidya tantra right which we are talking mm-hmm. about and you can um it's like you can use your prayatna as your currency correct? absolutely right yes. you, am, am i understanding this right you are right uh, prayatna that is your uh, your your sadhana right. as your currency correct to trade in and to get those karma off and uh, get good karma in yes right right uh, and then be ready for the next journey but they say that someone who practices shri vidya mm. it's probably going to be your last, last janma journey. that's okay. why you have been chosen ah. it's not that you choose shri vidya mm. it comes to you comes to you it is said that either your shiva himself that's why you're doing shri vidya mm. or because this is your ultimate lifetime mm. and you have done all the karmas Mm. you've pretty much washed off all your karmas your runanu bandhana is all over mm. and that's why to this in this janma you have the glory of practicing the shri vidya nice so i also i mean you you mentioned uh, shri vidya is from the agama tradition yes and now we didn't we didn't uh, we didn't go through that yeah question of mm. uh, what are agamas because yeah. you said after the puranas these were the agamas that came mm. in and now i understand that agamas are again hmm. the techniques or the rituals that are mentioned in those agamas right so the agamas were uh, largely focused on how to build temples mm. uh, what are the practices that need to go into a prana pratishtha for example okay. vastu uh, even astrology astronomy all these things mm. so uh, like i said this is a sadhana shastra and mm. it is what is called an upasana paddhati okay right so, so uh, 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 of to which agama does shri vidya belong largely the uh, shakti agamas okay how many so agamas are you there you have the shaiva mm. uh, the uh, vishnu ones uh, of course mm. and then the uh, the Va- that's the vaishnava one mm. and then you have the shakti agamas okay so this is largely derived the tantras are mainly from the shakti, shakti agamas agama. okay and uh, the tantra tradition itself is largely derived from kashmir shaivism okay So how did it come to the south why is it that shri vidya is so much more popular in the south mm. is a question which many people might ask mm. uh, adi shankaracharya he got his uh, initiation into shri vidya in kashmir mm. when he did that he also wrote the saundarya lahiri which is a very important seminal text mm. of shri vidya mm. and then he came down south and he established the first uh, shri antra in shringeri okay but from shringeri it went more into tamil nadu and andhra pradesh mm. and karnataka less so so the maximum number of shri vidya sadhakas you will find in tamil nadu Tam- and andhra, andhra today okay okay so that's a little bit of history of mm. shri vidya yes so we are talking about these agamas mm. the start of these agamas and shri vidya in mm. like what kind of time frame was it i would say about the 8th century because okay. we have to uh, correlate it to adi shankaracharya's journey from mm. kashmir to south india mm. and that's uh, the writing of saundarya lahiri and correct, the carrying exactly. of the shri yantra yes, to that yes this is to... what historians say okay and okay. if you go into uh, actual study of uh, the lineage mm. it goes back to about the 8th century and this is uh, initially it was extremely oral tradition mm. like everything in hinduism mm. and then uh, i think recently you know in the past 2 300 years mm. a lot has been written about tantra shastra and also about uh, shri vidya shri vidya i also read or heard that tantra was was like a conversation between shiva and parvati that's correct right yes so that must have happened even before so the thing in hinduism is that everything is uh, wrapped up mm. in myth 
depth and uh, magic and mystery yeah. history so, and right. sort of mixed up. yeah so it's all metaphorical mm. so even if you talk of the rudra yamala uh, mm. tantra or any of the texts their conversations between individuals mm. like the lalita sahasranama for example was spoken between uh, haya griva the rishi haya griva and agastya ah so everything like uh, when you hear a uh, sahasranama it's always said you know uvacha mm. Mm. which means that it is spoken he told this. yeah he yeah. spoke and it's like a dialogue mm. it's never that there is one person sitting there giving you gyan mm. it's always open to question and answer mm. and if you know even about adi shankaracharya he his fame was because of his power of debate Mm. he was able to even uh, his historical debates with mandan mishra mm. for example because i think a two way dialogue gives way to so much more information than just one person speaking yeah yeah because it's two minds coming together trying to get the best out of each other yeah it's the oldest form of podcast i would say absolutely yes <laughs> <laughs> right true true <laughs> and it's a recorded version yes. this is what we have right <laughs> and right true. that's nice 